I think you can handle this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, that is the that is the best place, but I didn't know where is. Okay, so uh, Satya, are we online and all that? Yes. So uh, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone in the room. Welcome everyone joining us online. Uh, really sorry for this uh, delay. We had to get a Unix system connected to Zoom and to the protection screen here in the um, uh, NMR room where we are. Um, Satya trying his best to get the camera set up. Uh, but it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Deshdeep Dev, uh, who was at, I'm going to keep this really short, who was at IIT Kanpur. Most of you probably already know him, know of him. Uh, established Quasar Technology, which has done a lot in trying to do instrumentation at the cutting edge, but at an amazingly low price point. Um, uh, and I think he's going to tell us all about his story today. So rather than give a very long background, I'm going to just let you talk. Um, and we're already missed a bit. And I'll make sure that we um, you you do, do take care of this. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, so now you can share the screen and uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so where do we uh, where's the control? I think you know, there. You know, how do you see that? Yeah, so, so can you turn this around? We turn it around. We turn it around. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. You know, I will I will move your slide. No, let him move it. In, in, okay. In the circle. I'll I'll just start doing it. Then maybe uh I stand and do this. Yeah. Or, good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh okay. Okay. all right. So I'll have to explain. I'll have to just start we'll by... get rid of this floating controls one second. Right. I'll just get rid of this. Yeah. Okay, I think you're all yeah. set. You can move this chair, all right? Yeah. Okay, that makes it easier. Right, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, no, I think it's up there. So the problem with which we we sort of started out, right? Well, of course, there is the conventional way of trying to do physics, but we. I was trying to experiment with what the minimal ecosystem we really needed to set up was so that we could actually have a much more sustainable form of science. Right now, all of it is, uh, most of the R&D in the country is really being supported and sustained by the government. And uh, with uh, a large amount of money coming in, uh, but the question was, is this, can this be made into a self-sustaining enterprise? And uh, I will try to explain to you how we tried approaching that problem. But what we had to really start setting up was experiment, theory, instrumentation, and computation under a single roof. If we had all four uh, of these elements, I mean, there's, a, there's theory going on in the country and there are theoretical groups and so on. There is, there is experiment going on also, but with minimal interaction between theory and experiment within the country. I mean, the, the number of people, number of theorists who are embedded in experimental groups and whose primary job and profile is to help that group uh, give direction and insight into, uh, into what types of experiments to set up and, and give direction to that. Those are relatively few. If you have to set up experiments, you really are going to need instruments. At the moment, 
Instrumentation is something that we're very weak in. Most of the instruments that we are trying to do research with have all been imported. And therefore, they're also support becomes a major issue. Right now, there are lots of other problems with, with trying to get things through customs and import them. These supply lines are very, very long. And therefore, it's very difficult. If anything goes down, then that's like a kiss of death, all right? It just remains down for a long time. And then, of course, increasingly, to bring about contact between theory and experiment, you need competition. I mean, computers have really come into their own in many, many different ways. And probably the, the simplest way of explaining that is that if you look at quantum mechanics, all of us do the hydrogen atom, all right, as part of a, a first quantum mechanics course. You move on to helium, and then you have variational methods and this and that, and you can you can do something. All right. By the time you come to lithium and and you know beryllium and boron, there is no way that you're going to move forward without computers. All right. So Hartree had put down his theory, and then you know of course Fock had anti-symmetrized the Hamiltonian and all that stuff. Uh, the but it was only in the 60s when computers came up that th this was one of the first problems to which people started applying computers. All right, so computation very, very quickly, no matter which field you get into, the first few simple examples where you're trying to establish principles are the ones that you can solve analytically. Immediately after that, you have to start developing programs and, and packages and this and that. Otherwise, you're not going to move. So all four of these are absolutely necessary, all right? And uh, they do require a certain mindset where people are being able to talk to each other, even though they are in these different disciplines. All right. So that was the idea. Now, the, uh, you know, I was of course trained as a theorist, so I didn't have a problem with that. Computation is still accessible. It was more, the most inaccessible part was instrumentation. So that's why I, I decided that that's where we are right tackling the problem. All right. I'm just going to get rid of this so then. Yeah, so, but so. for some reason, it keeps coming back. You know, that's because some... No, no. So I'm asking him to be a co-host so that he can take care of all that. Because every time somebody enters the room, you'll get this problem. No, no, that's fine. Right. Uh, it won't happen anymore because now Satya will take care of it. Okay, fine. Now you're, you're... All right. So now the uh, there was... I mean, one of the things that we'll use is this strong link between academia and industry and we'll have to define the roles of each in order to to figure out how this was going, this would work but the idea all right the basic flow is that we want to do this multifaceted research so we start by actually building all the instruments which we need with a lot of which are high tech and we built enough of them that we have a fully integrated laboratory in which everything that we've built has essentially been built from scratch, all right? And in that case, we really do have a sustainable environment for research, all right? Now, this is, of course, a theoretical slide right now. The question is, how does the development take place? Where do you get the money from? Well, you develop the instruments. The first instrument you have to somehow get money for. I mean, in my case, I got it from... I was being paid a salary by IIT Kanpur, so I, I, I was able to just use part of that salary to develop the first instrument. And then you turn the instruments into marketable products. Right. You work out creative applications using those instruments. Because nobody is going to buy instruments for the sake of buying them. They, only when you show them what can be done with the instrument, all right, with, are they going to be interested. But once you've gotten to that particular point, and each one of these is a non-trivial step, all right. But once you've got the applications worked out, then the marketing will take place and you will get finance, which you now put into making the next instrument. And you keep going through this loop over and over again until you built up full laboratories, all right. And then you, you're off and running. But it's all very closely integrated. I mean, these are these arrows should not be one-way arrows, the two-way arrows. There's just interaction going on. All right, so now this is the only slide that you really have to keep at the back of your mind. And the rest of it is going to be about how this got implemented. As we've been trying to implement it, I mean, the, the whole thing started about 20 years ago. All right, so this is 
just a summary of what has happened over that period of time. We're still alive. We haven't gone under. All right. We have not taken any money from any source other than the market. So everything has been sustained by building instruments, taking them to the market, whatever money we get, we use that and so on. All right. And the, okay, so let's just start with one instrument that we built. All right, and I'll just take you to the, to the, through the, uh, the story of how we built that. But before I, I tell you the story, I have to tell you what the instrument is. Because when we started, we also didn't know. I mean, we just started reading up about it. So it, it's a scanning tunneling microscope. And probably the easiest way of, of telling you what, what it does is that if you open out one of these, your computer boards, you see something of this sort with everything on the scale of centimeters. You take a small part of it, magnify it, and you see all these tracks which are on the scale of millimeters. All right. There is an uh, IC out here, which you can now magnify. And then once again, you have circuits, but everything is on the scale of micrometers. And there are ICs inside the IC. And those ICs, if you open out, in this case, it's a deep flip flop. It doesn't matter really what it is. On the scale of 100 nanometers, it is. it looks like this. All right. Oh, let's come back. Will... No, no, no. He, he can't even log into his machine. I'll just use my laptop. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. Okay, we go uh, one more step. And this is on the scale of 10 nanometers. The image on the left has been taken with our own microscope. All right. And then you go down to the scale of one nanometer and you start seeing atoms. All right. So the uh, Um, now, how do you get to this particular, and, and what an STM does, I mean, this whole revolution where we've gone all the way down to atoms and where we're going from the micro, from microscopes to nanoscopes and to nanotechnology and nanoscience is basically, this has come about uh, with the help of a scanning tunneling microscope, which was built for the first time in 1982. And that's the first time that we managed to resolve atoms. I mean, that happened in IBM Zero. Now, how does it work? Well, normally when we think of microscopes, we think of, of optics. I mean, then that was the natural thing. We were using eyes to see things. So you thought that you make a super eye or you know, a better lens system, a better focusing system and so on. You can now magnify things. But the STM is based on a completely different principle. To understand it, you have to think of a person who's blind and preferably blind from birth. All right. So he or she has a very sensitive touch. And let's say that person is trying to recognize a particular statue of somebody. So what will the person do? Well, he or she will touch, let's say, the face in the statue All right. and will will start scanning it. As he or she scans it, there are sensations on the tips of the fingers of that person. Those sensations pass through circuits in the arm and reach the brain of the person. In the brain, there is an image processing program that converts those sensations into an image, or right, the image of that particular statue. Right. Now, that's exactly what is happening here. You have a probe which is the step that comes in, all right? And uh, the and so this is the finger of the, the blind person. This one out here is the surface you're trying to scan. So that's the, the statue itself, or, or, or let's say the statue is of, of, of a base, all right? So this is the base. And now when you bring this step very, very close to the surface, all right? and you apply a bias voltage between the two, you just connect the battery between this step and this, all right? Give me a second, yeah. sorry.
Okay. Uh, for some reason, we. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, if you have, if you connect a battery between these two, it will just be a nine volt battery. All right. But you have to bring it very close. How close? Well, you have to bring it to within three or four angstroms of the surface, or right? three or four atomic distances. You will get a small current flowing through quantum, through the process of quantum tunneling. All right. That small current. I mean, you advance this step by very, very small steps. In fact, in our microscope, we walk over an atom in 25 steps. So we sample this tunneling current at 25 points across the atom. Right? And these tunneling currents are now the sensations at the tips of the fingers. All right? this, the values of these tunneling currents are now transmitted to a computer, which is like the brain of the blind person. And there is an image processing program running there, which converts the tunneling currents into an image of the surface. So the analogy is exact. You have the finger out here, which is the tip, which is just a piece of wire. It could be tungsten wire, or it could be platinum iridium. And then you've got the, the statue or whatever it is that you're trying to image, you have the sensations, which are the tunneling currents, and then you have the computer, which is the, the brain of the person, and you have an image processing program running. All right. Now, it's, it's an absolute irony that, you know, these images, that, which are the highest resolution images of nature that we've been able to get to. All right. People with eyes have learned how to get to that point through people who are blind. All right by actually watching them. So uh, now this is when we first tried making it, we just didn't have the confidence that we could get the entire electron. I was coming from particle theory. I've never really done any electronic or even enter a lab, frankly, you know, willingly uh, up to that point. And now we were going to try to make this. So we just, the only thing was to make it in, in parts, get that much working and then connect it to the next part, right? And then we had, now, of course, in this, there are going to be two challenges. One was getting the tip that close. But even when you get it to within three or four atomic distances, if there is a car that goes by and it will create tremors in, in the road, and those tremors will come through the walls and through the floor, and they'll come into your apparatus. And if, if your tip starts oscillating by more than four angstroms is going to crash into the, into the surface. So you've got to keep it from doing that. So you somehow have to isolate the entire apparatus from any type of vibrations. So we went into a basement and then we took this stool out here. This is where the sand had fallen. We took this stool and we put the feet of the stool in sand in the hope that when it comes through, the vibrations come through, that we try to travel through sand and, and the particles of sand will, will sort of rub against each other and remove the vibrations to whatever extent. And then there was just some piece of sponge that was there which we thought would only help. So we sort of bunk that in. All right. And the, the scanning was inside this aluminum box, which was which is providing the electrical shielding also. So it wasn't just shielding from the mechanical vibrations. It also had to be from all the electrical disturbances and so on. But looking at this, you have to be a true believer to think that you're going to get atoms out of this. Okay? Uh, but, but miracles happen. And, you know, we would start scanning late at night at about 10 or 10 o'clock or so. And then everything quietened down and there were no cars or trucks or anything. And no, no, this was in Delhi. And uh, but so we just stepped out for dinner once around 10 o'clock when we get this phone call all right which is like one of these dreaded phone calls saying i think you should come back you say good god now what has happened here he says well this time it's nothing i i, I think i'm just seeing atoms i said what he said yeah i said are you sure he said absolutely so i said okay In that case we are coming back here so we skipped dinner we came back and this is what <clears throat> The, the student working on it showed us, 
when it started zooming. And now, as you're zooming, you're beginning to see the same thing at bigger and bigger scales. And then with just a bit of image processing, you start seeing the atoms. And you say, wow, yeah, this is really work. And suddenly, your confidence shoots up. Yeah? You start really believing that all this stuff does mean something. You know, It's like when the microwave background was discovered, you know, all these people said, well, maybe what we are doing makes sense, yeah. All right. Until then, nobody quite believed it, you know. Or as another friend of mine put it, he says, you know, our duty as physicists, the minimal duty is to actually believe in what we are doing, all right? which itself at times can become pretty hard. So, and then of course, the people who are, I have to acknowledge that Anjan uh, Gupta from, I, this is through a, a, a very close collaboration between uh, academia and industry. So it was the Inter-University Center at uh, Accelerator Center in New Delhi. I mean, both Ajit and Kundan worked on the electronics and the first version of the electronics was built by them. Anjan has built the scan head, which has been just absolutely robust and, and has, we've not had to change it at all across 70 or 75 units that we've built, all right. And then he is a professor at IIT Kanpur. And then Quasar Tech, it was Joshua who put the whole thing together, wrote the software and got the atoms out for the first time. And then was a VSRP and DIF for- Right, the, yes. The VSRP project was to design an STM walker. Okay, all right. So it's, but, but even before that, he had started working with me on this at ITK. And so, but so, the obsession had developed. Then he worked here and then he went back. At the moment he started his PhD, he told his advisor that this is what I'm going to do. And the advisor says, but I, I don't know how to do it. Said, don't worry about that. I'll do it myself. Just let me do it. This. I mean, just give me the freedom. So, so that's, so in this very strange way, the whole thing had developed and reached this point. And then this evolved into this. All right. The entire electronics collapsed into a single box. This whole vibration isolation arrangement turned into this vibration isolation state, which came, I should put down the name. <laughs> there was a master, uh, there was a design program being run at IIT Kanpur and by Amit Ray. And uh, so the two of us guided a student who then produced this. All right. And uh, this, the scan head is out there. And then the electronics have now evolved further and become more compact and more and more powerful. So we've taken it to three or four generations now. All right. And just at each time we make it, the first thing that we do is to resolve atoms on the surface of highly oriented py pyrolytic graphite. All right just to make sure that the whole system is actually working. And uh, we, as you can see, we get very sharp images out. And uh, there's something interesting in these images, which I should point out. You see, this highly oriented pyrolytic graphite consists of these hexagonal benzene type rings. And then you've got one layer, which is a blue layer on top, there's a second layer below. All right. And the first thing, when you look at this, you'd say, well, why don't, why doesn't the image look hexagonal? Why is it looking much more, tri you know, uh, triangular? And the answer is that because of this, the way this layout, you've got in the top layer, you've got three different, I mean, you've got two different types of atoms. You've got those atoms which have nothing below them in the next layer. And then you've got this blue atom with a green atom just below. And of course, you have a green atom with nothing above. Now, the, the tunneling current is very, very sensitive to the distance that the tunneling has to, over which the tunneling has to occur, all right? And uh, the, uh, it's, as all of us know, the tunneling current, if there's a barrier, the tunneling current goes down exponentially. More concretely, what happens is that if you increase this distance by just one angstrom, or right, one atomic distance, the tunneling current comes down by a factor of 10. 
because of the it's because of this very sharp drop that you're able to see the atoms that clearly. So the moment you come right on top of an atom, the tunneling current shoots up. It just shoots right up. Okay. You can see if you're standing along this yellow line, the tunneling current is shot up to this thing. And if you're anywhere in between, it's come down. <coughs> so when you're here, you get a large tunneling current. When you're here, you get a very small tunneling current. But what happens at this point? Well, at this point, what happens is, is interesting. You have this blue atom being pulled down by the green atom through a, the Van der Waals force. And just because of that pull, the tunneling current comes down dramatically. So you've got these areas which are not as dark as this, which are reddish. All right. This is where you have this depressed atom sitting. All right. You put the depressed atoms in place and you get the next one. All right. So in these images, not only are you seeing the atom, but you're even seeing the Van der Waals forces between the atoms. You said, wow, yeah. that's really something. Yeah. And the, um, so then um, there's one thing, of course, that has to be told. And that is that when we say that we, we built it, it really means that we have designed and machined every mechanical component with our own hands, all right? So this part was all Anjan. And he had done all of this and he taught us how to do this. Now, the next one was the electronics. We designed and soldered all of it and resoldered it and took it through all these. Generally, I mean, the electronics itself over the last 10 years, all the components and everything have all changed, become much more compact, as you know, just by using cell phones. Yeah. The whole thing has you know, become more and more powerful and smaller and smaller. And for that reason, Components that were there 10 years ago have become obsolete. You have to keep on moving. Otherwise, the whole thing collapses. And then you, uh, of course, every line of the software had to be written. All right. And that he wrote. And uh, then, of course, the ergonomics, all this designing and, you know, making the whole thing collapse and, and making a very compact vibration isolation system or a scan head. But one of the other very important innovations that was required was that the entire technical documentation for this thing is in Hindi because uh, the, the people who are working on it and who are making it have never gone to college, all right? And they speak only Hindi. And by switching the whole thing into Hindi, all right? You don't, of course, use abstruse words or anything of that sort. You want to use say computer, you say computer because everyone who speaks Hindi knows what it uses the same word, all right? I mean, to use one of these, I mean, if, if you use any of the words that these people have invented for compu computers, all right, even the guys who speak Hindi will not be able to understand it. So, so we have just declared all the common words to be Hindi words, all right? And, and you know, we can just appropriate them because there are uh, many more of us than there are of, of English speaking guys. So we can just say that but that's a word that belongs to our language now. And we just use it that way. But when you do that, this thing starts happening. All right. So now this is a zoom on grains of this word tellerite. It's a fascinating zoom because for a couple of reasons. All right. You keep zooming until you on one grain and, and yet to, until you actually resolve the atomic lattice. Now, where you start to zoom off, all right, is just four microns by four microns. Right? But what is four microns? Four microns is one two fiftieth of a millimeter. Everyone knows what a millimeter is. You take that millimeter and you break it into 250 parts. You're left with the edge of a sharp knife. You cross that edge with another edge and you get a point. All these worlds which are opening out are inside that one point. Okay? So if you zoom, this is, so there is as much of a universe as you zoom in as when you zoom out. All right. And this is exactly, this whole question of scale is a remarkable one. The other thing is this image now, once you've got this information, then the image processing program, which is just the power of the brain, all right, and the computer can image the entire thing in three dimensions and you can rotate it and you can do all of that. 
when I put this here, I'm putting this here because the person who developed the program was also a sport Prabhu, right? So, and he was doing his PhD in IIT Madras. He was studying these aerodynamical flows. He was in the aerodynamics department, right? And so he developed a program called Mayavi, which is a perfect name for it. An image processing program, the illusionist. All right. So, um, and then that is what we have used as it's an open source program. So that's what we've used as the base. Of so, what you're seeing here is just Indian technology in action at all levels, including the very packages that we've used. All right. Uh, everything is Indian. All right. So now the wait, what happened here now? Um, wait. Wait, so what is I hope that all of it did download. Yeah, we didn't even have time to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there some uh, yes, I mean, the point is that the uh, can we just go down to see uh, what uh, yes. how far the whole thing goes? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the you see these currents right now, we can scan at uh, all the way down to uh, something like um, one. Pico ampere, all right. And uh, in principle, we could push it down. Oh, so for some reason, the uh, the rest of it doesn't seem to have downloaded. Yeah, the remaining slide. No, no, there are some from some, 42 right, onwards. 42 onwards, but the intermediate one has been downloaded. Can we make a PDF? Can we have it on the drive? Yeah, so yes, all of those, I mean, uh, we, we in fact, right now, uh, uh, we're going down to about a pico ampere, but we want to go down by, uh, or uh, to, and, and th that effectively gives us a resolution, spatial resolution, all right? Uh, and with the voltages that we apply, it gives us spatial resolution of about four picometers. Right? An atom, I'll remind you, is about 100 picometers in size. So that's how, that's where we're getting this number of 25. Well, right now, those are, I think, masked by the thermal effects. I mean, the whole thing is jiggling around and it's just shaking. They're just so. What you're seeing is really the average now value of the of size square, right? Of the rate function square. But what we now need uh, is um, to so we lower the temperature and we brought it down to liquid nitrogen, right? and uh, that does make the images sharper. That's the one thing that we want. But now, you know. We just about, I mean, well, we just about got the liquid nitrogen thing going because it has now uh, two other problems that we, the non trivial problem that we have to solve. And that is that you can create that very low temperature only in a finite, finite region of scale. And you have to then, your scan head has to be lowered into that. And you still have to make sure that there are no vibrations. I mean, these vibrations we've been able to eliminate down to about an amplitude of one of about two picometers, so one fifty of the picometers. All right, and you have to maintain that even when you you you're in this very restricted space. So our own vibration isolation arrangement was much larger in size, so we now have to reduce it to by a huge amount and yet maintain that same level of isolation. So we managed to do that, but the yeah, hmm. there is a problem. Uh, it didn't get uploaded even. Hmm. 
then get uploaded. So can we make it easier for me to again? Right, PDF and try. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry for uh, people who are on the virtual uh, meeting. Uh, please uh, bear with us for a few minutes. We'll just get this started. So I think instead of doing the whole, uh, this is the folder, what we need to be this, load the file. The file itself is the file. So let's make it easier. Right. Let's first take the file to be here itself. Uh, meanwhile, questions are right. right. So, we might as well just use the time for questions. Yes, both, uh, right. both from here, right? Right now, right. oh, I see. So, yes, okay. So, when, when he's, he started, uh, it's most people have not used STM before, and even if we gave it to them, even at a low price, they didn't really know what to do with it. But and they, oh, so the, 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 well, uh, oh, uh, they're almost the entire market, 100% of it mm -hmm. is academic. All right. Okay. It is not being, it's not in the. Uh, yeah. But I think people know, and I'll ask, I'll tell why. Right. I, I think people know from this matter or people who are doing some chemistry or other, who are not necessarily. Uh, no, uh, these, these are people who are, uh, uh, but they are all. Uh, well, uh, most of them are in physics, and uh, there are some in material science. There have been about 25 or 30 papers that people have uh, written, not exclusively with the STM, but which have, which cite the, this particular STM in the text itself. I mean, if you go to Google and you look for the NanoRev STM from Quasar Tech or Quasar Technologies, you'll find about 30 papers, or 25 or 30. So people have been able to do a certain amount of it by way of research. We ourselves have done various things which I'll just show you. And, um, but, the moment we have been able to take it down to low temperatures, the level of interest from the research community and even from academics doing research has gone up a lot. But I mean, there's no, I mean, it's great. I mean, like you can think about it, right? It's very smart with the state of the art system to figure out there. Right. Now, but the state of the art, uh, yes, is to take the dilution with physics, right? I mean, in that is the state of the art. No, and right. You okay. also get a thing from the doing of people. Like, you know, you can apply it. So, there's the atomic resolution. Okay. So, no, no, the atomic residue, wait, the atomic resolution is not better. It is just that the temperature to which they go down is much lower. I mean, uh, one can actually map the whole thing to I'll just show that. To you because I'll, I'll just show you that. So, we an academy, how do I then justify uh, basically going for, okay, simple cost, going for the instrument? It's not really there. Uh, wait, wait. Maybe I'll let him kind of open the mic. Right. Yeah. Yes, now suppose we just no, no. All right, we just so open it and, and we just turn it into a PDF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that in detail because we have to work it out. Yeah. And the whole survival depends on that. If we can't answer that question, all right, uh, then we're not going to be, uh, I mean, since the money is coming from actually installing and doing all of that. So we turn it into a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Deshdeep, I have a question from Zoom. Right. Ah, uh, Hi. <laughs> yeah, but my question is, uh, are you planning at some stage in the talk to also be talking about the vibration isolation technology you've developed? Mm -hmm. If not, you could use this time to tell us a little bit about it. Low level vibration of the hands will help. 
One second, I just got distracted by this. Uh, I'll, I'll just come back. Uh, I'll just come back to that question. Uh, uh, okay, this is what you did. PDF now. We want to upload the Yeah, okay. Sorry, I asked the question again, Krishna. Now you have my attention fully. Yeah, uh, I was asking about the technology that you've developed for vibration isolation at the right. requisite levels. If that is any way part of your talk, then you can defer answering the question. Otherwise, no, you can it's answer not. it now. It, it, okay. this, is, this is all I was going to say about it at the moment. But now, okay. But now, since you're asking me, the, what is the question? What more do you, what would you like me to say about it? The technical aspects, the mechanical oh, aspects. How, 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 have, you how have you engineered it? it? Oh, it's, it's entirely through uh, uh, spring mass systems and multiple stages of, of isolation through the spring mass systems themselves and different types of, uh, of springs that, that we brought into play. And we tried with various materials, which uh, some of which worked much better than others. But it was basically a, a, you know, a spring mass system with multiple stages. And whenever we've needed more of it, we uh, have just increased the number of stages and that seems to have worked. We uh, did not do any extensive calculations or anything. We just did it purely experimentally. So what is the corner frequency? The corner, corner cutoff frequency? Uh, it is very low. It's, it's of the order of few hertz. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I don't know whether that's considered low or not. I mean, for, for the, the work that you were doing on trying to detect the fifth force, um, it was probably, uh, I don't know whether that was good enough or not. I, I think I have a rough answer, but when you say few hertz, you mean 10 hertz or you mean two hertz? What do you mean? It's a little below 10. Okay. But yeah. Thanks. Of, the, of that order. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, other questions that we can take? Yeah. No, no, within the STM, we are not. But when we now move on to an AFM, then we do actually modulate. And we, we uh, and uh, interestingly, I mean, what you have is, is that you, you're uh, oscillating the tip. And when it comes close to the surface, then, uh, so you have a certain natural frequency when you're far away from the surface, then you come close to the surface. And when you come close, then because of the Van der Waals force, the tip comes and it tends to stick to the surface a bit and takes just that much longer to, to come up again. And as a result, the oscillation frequency or the, the, the time period becomes just that much longer and the frequency becomes uh, the uh, the frequency becomes that much lower all right and uh, you can measure that change in frequency all right and because of that that uh, and it's actually you can we can with the electronics that we built we were able to uh, measure changes of about three millihertz in about thirty thousand hertz. So it's one part in 10 to 7. And that information, just that hesitation is enough to tell you what there is on the surface. You can use that information to image the surface. Right. And I'll just show you some images of that. And I, first, I thought the images came out. We said, wow, yeah, this also seems to be working. But uh, it is still at a, 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 slightly, uh, on a, a slightly larger scale. But let me go back to your question about this thing, all right? First of all, I mean, I'll, I'll show you, uh, these images are, and I'll show you some more images of graphene and so on, all right? And those images are on par with the best that are there in the literature, all right? Now, uh, at, at low temperatures, all right? So the, if, if the resolution problem is not there, then it's the major problem is resolution. That is the temperature, how low can you go, all right? Because many of these transitions that you're trying to study are actually occurring at various temperatures, right? And the second thing is, is 
the UHP part. Okay, so now this is the two. All right. So we can pick up here. All right. So, uh, uh, but let me finish answering that. So um, now the uh, the economics works as follows. I mean, you have cars ranging from you know the the lower the lower end of the let's say the Maruti Suzuki's or one of those. All right or even the Nano, the, the original Tata Nano, and going up to the really fancy, you know, limousines with, you know, that the likes of, of I guess, Putin or somebody would, would drive, all right? With you. And, and the range is, is, is massive. I mean, you're going from, from maybe four lakhs to, to a crore or maybe a few crores, all right? Bulletproof, you can make it and so on. Right, uh, and each one of them has a market. All right, I mean we wouldn't consider buying a bulletproof car right? because we, I'm fortunately there's nobody hopefully gunning for us. All right, so the the point is that uh, now, depending on what the price is, all right, do you have a market for that price? So there are people who are interested in buying a four lakh, uh, you know. Maruti Suzuki, and there are people interested in buying 35 or 40 or 50 back Mercedes and people buying, you know, uh, a two crore bulletproof thing. So the fact that, you know, you're not making the two crore bulletproof thing doesn't mean that you won't be able to sell the four, four lakh Maruti. It's, it, is, it's, it is linked to the price, right? But now, so the, 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 the second question you can ask is, that if I go in for this, um, look, you know, this this minimally priced thing, can I do a lot of interesting things with it? And what are the interesting things I can do with it? Now, that burden has now come onto us. So that when I said that after you built this, the next step is is the creative applications, because the person says that look, unless you can show me interesting things that I can do with it and that I'm interested in, I'm not going to buy it, right? So now the whole burden of the applications also comes on to us. And that's what the question was because people are the main thing is about the same patterns or like what are the like kind of no uh, right no so so that that is what what we thought that once we we've gotten to the point where we can show them atoms and show them that this is the resolution that that we have. People would just jump at it. Nobody jumped at it. All right. We suddenly found that, you know, so, so one market that we had to look for is just the, uh, the undergraduate labs where you say, all right, you get them to repeatedly just see the atoms and measure the bond angles and, and you know, the bond lengths and measure the, the lattice constant and so on. And, uh, but so, uh, about, I would say that about 20 of the STMs, of the air STMs, were bought for that purpose alone. They were not immediately bought. It's, it's only after we've gotten the low temperature STM working, <laughs> has the interest of the research community suddenly shot up. And now none of them is interested. I mean, the air STM is sort of an accessory to the low, low temperature STM. I mean, they will, um, <laughs> they, they, you know, before you put your sample inside the tire stack where you're not going to be able to access it very easily, you study it uh, using the air STM first and then you put it in, all right? So, so it now becomes an accessory. I'm, so I'm just giving that as an example. All right, so now you seem to, uh, all right, keep running out of time. Wait, uh, how does this now change? Wait. Oh, yeah. All right. So now the, the next thing that we actually built was a system for making graphene. All right. Uh, and I'll, uh, I, since we lost about 10, 15 minutes, I guess we have about 15 minutes more. All right. So the, uh, and we've done this using a chemical vapor deposition system. And the recipe is very, very simple. You just pass methane and hydrogen over copper that you heat to about a thousand degrees centigrade. 
And how does this produce graphene? Well, you've got the source of carbon is, is methane, right? So you have CH4. The, and the CH4 comes and it absorbs. There are sites on which you know, it can just come and sit all right, on the surface of copper. All right. And at 1,000 degrees, I mean, copper melts at about 1,085. So it's already close to its melting point. So it's sort of, the surface is kind of molten. All right. uh, it is beginning to become, uh, beginning to shake around a bit. So when these things come, and even the hydrogen can come and absorb, the, uh, the four hydrogens that the, the central carbon is holding on to can get pulled away, all right? And that's basically what happens. It just, you know, on this kind of mobile surface and with a lot of hydrogen also coming in, the hydrogen is being, the, the, the hydrogen bonds are, are being broken and the, the additional hydrogen, which is there can also provide a second hydrogen with which you make an H2 molecule and the H2 molecule takes off, all right? So, and as, as the, so basically you dehydrogenate down, down to carbon and the dehydrogenated carbon either attaches itself to an existing graphene sheet or it nucleates a fresh sheet of its own. And slowly the whole thing is just woven up. And you've got, so you have CH4 and then you've got these sites on copper, all right? And these sites and uh, I mean, and so you have this, this is this absorbed CH4. And then one of the hydrogen gets pulled away. It goes to some other absorption site, are left with CH3, and it keeps going until finally you've got this whole thing being woven up. Right. Now the uh, and the hydrogen, it's the, initially you use it to just anneal the surface to remove whatever oxid, you know, oxide is present and so on. But it has a, a number of other. Uh, beneficial effects. And so you've got a recipe of this sort where you, you first keep the copper up to about a thousand degrees to then bring in uh, a, a certain flow of, uh, of CH4. You start it off at, at a given time and while you have the hydrogen uh, as the, again, uh, up to uh, two cubic centimeters per minute right through which you maintain. All right. So this is a typical recipe. When you, and very quickly, the whole surface in, in a very short while from the 60th minute to about the 90th. So in about half an hour, it just gets covered with graphene. You then cool the whole thing down. The copper shrinks and the graphene shrinks much less. In fact, it expands slightly. It has a negative expansion coefficient. And you're left with a certain number of wrinkles on the graphene, which allows you to actually see it under an optical microscope. Without that, it's, the, you, it's just very difficult to make out, as I'll just show you whether there is graphene there or not. All right, until you, you've zoomed in quite a bit. And even then, it's the wrinkles that you're able to pick out. It's like having a, a completely flat surface on the sea. If, if there are no waves at all, you know, it, you might not be able to detect something on, on the surface. And here it's just, it's very, very thin. So seeing it becomes difficult. All right, so now we'll just, uh, there are a whole bunch of parameters that you have to then control. You have to control temperatures, both spatial and temporal, you need pressures. And so uh, you need flow rates for various gaseous precursors. And then you need a whole bunch of safety features. All right, so, so we built a system in which we had this. And, uh, you know, I, I'll, this is, an old, old proverb for the new age art, an image is worth a thousand words, but now a video is worth a thousand images, right? Now, this is the modern age when we move from images to videos, all right? So I'll let the videos speak for themselves, all right? So I just want to run the videos and just show you a couple of videos of what we have built. Right. So, Which one? Uh, the uh, the CBD one, crystal CBD. This one? Yeah. 
Let's run that for a moment. No, no. Yeah. Okay, this is fine. Just run this. There is a bit of music and all that, but you know. No, but before that, I had to share it. Oh, you have to share it. Okay. Along with the music. The Crystal CVD 1100 is a state-of-the-art chemical vapor deposition system designed by Quasar Tech India. The system consists of a 1100-degree multi-zone split tubular furnace, vacuum system, four-channel mass flow controllers, safety interlocks, and complete control over process parameters through user-defined recipes. The multi-zone split tubular furnace can have up to 12 independently controlled heating blocks. Each block is 3 inch long, has its own Canthal A1 resistive heater wire and equipped with N-type thermocouple as temperature sensor. Users can achieve a 2.5 feet long isothermal zone by entering identical temperature set points to all heaters. This is useful for bulk processing of silicon wafers. Conversely, three or four different temperature zones of unequal lengths can be achieved by suitably clubbing heating blocks. Full control of furnace parameters are available on the real-time graphical user interface. User can engage or disengage mains supply, set temperature set points, monitor heater power consumption, and view actual temperature profile with the help of a multicolored histogram. The safety interlock always cuts off main supply to the furnace as soon as its lid is opened. A four-channel mass flow controller has been installed in the system. At the time of ordering, users can choose from 1000 SCCM, 100 SCCM, or 10 SCCM full-scale flow rates. Supported gases are nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, helium. Okay, yeah. Let's go back to the top. All right, but it gives you some sense of... of so now, using this, we've then been able to grow graphene two-dimensional uh, transition metal batch alkalinides and so on, and then use the STM to characterize. And that's what I'll just show you. So now slowly a closed system is forming where we can now see whether we can pull out papers which are uh, which can be published in international journals. Reduce the furnace by itself? No. Uh, 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 reducing it, I mean just pulling out parts and 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 uh, is very often as difficult because when you were it's not not when it is Maybe because there are more statements for furnace. There, there could be there could be uh, we'll have to do that but but it's still a, a, a developmental issue it's not uh, it just taking it because the software has been integrated there are all sorts of when you're turning it on it might just ask you whether the flows have all been turned off or not and because uh, and, and it's just that what side you right now we've we've done uh, a two inch thing but you know after we because each time you step into it you don't know the field completely these are all uh, that, that is part of the problem you know we, we, we're sort of coming in from completely different fields after we got into it, then we started realizing that people are into four inch papers and six inch papers and so on. And that this whole, the diameter has to be increased, etc. So now, I mean, increasing the diameter by itself, or at least in principle, is not necessarily uh, a very, very difficult task. But it's still, until you've actually done it, you know, but what we've learned from, from Experience is that something that you thought would be just a single step can often, the moment you open it up, it's 
it's a Pandora's box. You know, I mean, you make it bigger, your the this the, the the types of loops that you can now make in while winding the heaters is that something changes, you know, and so uh, until we do it, we're not one hundred percent sure. The other thing, but let's run one more video, and that is of the uh, the SCM itself, where we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, once you said uh, each of the different zones, uh, you have any data of the uniformity around the yeah, right, right, right. right. I mean, the, 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 the temperature profile along the whole thing. Along the whole thing is, uh, I think, we will stand it, but that's what? So, you have a tube and you have this. Uh, oh, right. So, 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 how much does it change as, as you go? Along the tube, right. Right. The, the cross section. Yeah. But we, we can we can measure that and get that data for you. Which right. uh, which one of these? Uh, Let's do the the uh, wait. the two of them on this so, right. No, the the, the live scan like this. this okay. Yeah. Hmm. And see the yeah, I think it's this doesn't have uh, audio. Ah, yeah. it is there. Yes. So this is again the first thing we got the whole thing working. I mean, the, the, the vibrations were low enough. Now, these are atoms of, of uh, again, the surface of highly oriented bilateral graphite, but now at 150 K. All right. The, uh, and so for our temperature controllers, all our electronics, remember that everything has been built from scratch, right? All of it had to be working for this to, and, and uh, you know, um, all of the we had done. I mean, when that's what, what I, I meant that when, when we say that we built it, means that we have designed and cleaned all the mechanical components with our own hands or there to the way things we thought. We've designed and soldered the electronics, we've written the software, and we made many of the materials of which we've done this. So, in that sense, our feet are kind of on the ground, but there are still things that we we are dependent on from outside. This has become like 90% local, but 10%. And in the 10%, even one component missing, which goes missing, can completely throw a spanner in the works. So it's not that, that but I mean, obviously, having 90 or 95% under your control is better than having only 20% under your control. Right. So, so that, that's the kind of advance. Uh, the and in that five percent, five or ten percent that you don't control, when you are getting it, you just go ahead and buy enough for the next. Many of these components, we bought enough of them for the next hundred SDMs. Right. So in that sense, the control become local, right? I mean, un unless we change the design, but it becomes also a constraint on the design. You can't change it so that that component is no longer needed or you want to change that component or you want to improve it. So these decisions are all tough decisions because they're, 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 they have economic consequences also because when you buy so much in bulk, it might become cheaper, but then you're not allowed to change the design. We made those errors and lost a lot of money <laughs> because you bought too quickly. Right, okay, so let's uh, return, I'll, I'll wrap up. Now, I mean, are they all these interruptions? Yeah, yeah. But uh, do you also want to play any more video or uh, no, 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 no more videos? All right. Let's just get back to the talk. Sure. Yeah, the next thing after this. Okay, so now this was. Uh, this is the copper. Do you see the copper foils are then you to have rollers and you extrude the copper foil. So you take thicker copper and you push it through rollers which are hot 
and then <laughs> then you you bring the rollers it's exactly the way you you get cane juice yeah we first have the rollers which are far apart then you you tighten it a bit then you get some more juice out and so on right it's the same thing but but as a result these rolling lines are seen all right optically then sorry scale of this uh this is th these are optical images so these were on the scale of, of several hundred microns i mean I mean, like this sorry this is no 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 this is just simple uh, this was taken at sspl with with their uh, i should have put that down so to see sspl on the olympus uh, this was no this is about an hour or two of an evening uh, but at a high temperature in high temperature. Yeah, so so the rolling lines have become a little less prominent and the grains the, the grains you see are being able to be able to see but there is allegedly uh now in this case there is sorry um, this one right so there is uh in this allegedly graphene on top of this now you can't really make out until you, you keep zooming and now because of these wrinkles out here right you know that it's there and but then you've got the the stm right so you can you can now zoom in with the stm and now you start seeing these wrinkles much more prominently and you can go further and you go all the way to the atomic level and and you're you here because the thing has come off, it's not a by there. You see the full hexagon. You see these six atoms sitting there. All right. The six carbon atoms. And equally, you get this chicken net structure. And you, but you see the wrinkles very, very clearly, right? At that distance. So this one, now you see these uh, with just the, the raw images. So these are, uh, I mean, these are, uh, in fact, uh, these have really not appeared in the literature, uh, except in one paper, partially, in, in uh, and that's, right, STM, these, with these wrinkles, I'm talking about wrinkles with this particular thing. So they say if these wrinkles are because of the copper surface? No, sorry? These wrinkles are because of the copper surface underlining, underlying no, it. No, no, no. Uh, this, uh, well, it's not one hundred percent sure whether it's the this. These are uh, uh, most probably these are. Uh, this is uh, freestanding graphene, but there are there are pits below. I mean, the copper surface itself has has. Uh, there, there are trenches over which this particular thing covered with with graphene, but. I mean, you can't avoid these wrinkles because when you when you're if if there are any pits there and and the thing actually shrinks, you will uh, in in general pick up these particular uh, wrinkles. So I have a couple of problems with this. One is that the the wrinkles themselves seem to be patterned. Now here's the thing: uh -huh. uh, the you've taken this to about a thousand degrees centigrade, and then uh, this will now cool down to this is of course room temperature scanning, right? That's fine, but uh, the underlying substrate, uh, when the graphene was getting formed, was molten, or uh, close to being molten copper. Uh, so, not a very good structure, and therefore not very good patterning. So, why does the patterning in the wrinkles then emerge later? Okay, I, my questions no, no, are over. I'm, I'm, I'm the muting. Wrinkles, the wrinkles, I mean, these uh, wrinkles are on top of a graphene layer, and the patterns are just the atoms on the graphene. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, a lot depends on uh, this one. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I, don't know I can hear you. Yeah. So a lot depends on first thing you're not you're not near the melting point of copper in this uh, for the CPD graphene below the melting point clearly. And uh, no matter what you do, you see the entire history of the copper in the graphene when you remove it. Uh, and uh, a lot depends on how slowly you put it or how quickly you put it and that the cooling. Uh, remember the the incorporation of the carbon is actually much more during the cooling process than I mean there's not a lot of you know you don't need a heck of a lot of carbon, you just want to give me a monolayer of carbon. 
So, uh, a lot depends on how you do it. Because it's in much more medical, uh, which is what people have done. We tabled with CV graphene and better well. So, I mean, it's a cooling, is, the cooling is, I think, the most critical part in defining your uh, what kind of a CV graphene you get. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nesli, if you can please proceed. I'm sorry for the interruption. So, and then these are Mori patterns. Now, th this is when, when you've got a, a layer on top of another layer, but at, at a specific angle. You have regions which are bright and, 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 and dark. And these are again, uh, here you just see the, the bright regions, all right? But because this is on the scale of 60 nanometers, so this is on a much, much bigger scale. And when you're viewing, the, the previous ones are almost down to the atomic scale. So you can see the atoms inside the bright and dark field. Here, this is uh, from a much higher distance. But you get these, these, these images, and all of these are actually with the air STM. The scanning tunneling spectroscopy, which will tell you how many tunneling states are available, all right, that is something which is done much better with the um, with at low temperatures because i mean just the thermal noise is about um you know it's it's about 25 uh, millivolts at room temperature and goes down to about seven millivolts at, at uh and liquid nitrogen temperatures and so then after that we we grew mos2 you have all these crystals these are a certain number of papers these are quantum dots that say uh KB Janesh, who's taken the STM and has, he had used it extensively in the Netherlands before he came here. And then he was able to immediately take it and he's written eight or nine papers with it. Uh, so, so far we've grown graphene using the CVD and analyzed the results using the, the STM. We're currently studying the deposited films using the LDOS mode of the low temperature STM. Uh, copper and graphene are easy to are easier to distinguish through LDOS, so we'll probably be able to play around with all of that. All right, and I'll just very quickly. This is these are just images, so we can go through them fast. With the atomic force microscope, I was telling you that. So this is uh, what we did was that we this is the top layer of the eighty five four nine, which is an IC that. We blew up many times, and so we just opened it to see whether we could scan it. And here you can see that this is 1985 ADI, all right, uh, analog devices incorporated. This is from the, their website. This is what the top layer is supposed to look like, all right. And this was the first time that we were able to image it using this change in frequency, all right, that information. And you can see the 1985 ADI, and this is in the scan and the retrace. This is to some extent, the analog of, of seeing the atoms for the first time with the STM. All right. But this is right now on an effectively just uh, you know, a few hundred nanometer skin. When you try bringing it all the way down to a resolution of a nanometer, the noise levels are still uh, reasonably high and it's still hit or miss. We've not been able to fully get that under control. Right. But this at least, you know, and then we can, this is the optical image, this is the STM image, and you can take it in parts and keep stitching it together through the software. All right. So anyway, okay, so, and then these people got excited, so they took out some blood and it scanned it with the, the AFM to see whether they could see any of the, uh, you know, red, <coughs> uh, the, the, the blood cells and so on. And then, then the rest of it will stop. I think, uh, with, um, I guess the stroke will go up and down is probably the most interrupted one, but hopefully the essence has gotten through. Uh, yeah, uh, any other questions from Zoom audience or uh, okay, let me also check if there are any questions in the uh, by the YouTube as well. Okay, YouTube, I don't find any. Um, okay, I don't see any more 
questions any any other questions here as well so i have seen yeah yeah talk so for the mask principles are interesting are we going to no 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 we we made them from scratch yeah. so far everything's been made from scratch but we are not trying to revise that policy because uh it is because sticking to it is 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 uh it's just proving to be very difficult to economic so for example the care system right what is the like how how fine you can control it it is about the it's uh the control i mean the the resolution is what you're asking what is about 10 to the minus 4 of the code scale within 10 to 90% of the range or 10 to the minus 4 yeah no, so so basically, if I have one part in 10, it's 10,000. If I have a 1060 MFC, I will between 160 and 10 to 90. Right. Using the control of the screen with that, if it's 10 to the minus 4, it will be 1. Right. Yeah, it's of that order. I think that it's of that order. That's great. That's great. That is it. That's great. Right. I don't think we can. We, we, we had made it originally for the GC for the gas chromatographs. We hadn't, we've now used it for the CVD. But I have not published uh, because the, the two of the major competitors, right? Basically, and Alka, right? Both are also having a similar spec. They have similar spec. Uh, the go off and turn them. Right, right. But it takes time to train people to build them to get things to understand the market and all that stuff. Right? I mean, uh, I mean, the numbers are there, right. right. So the, the numbers are, I mean, uh, as the, the MFC we got to working quite some time ago, and that time I myself was, I mean, I would buy, if you, uh, you know, yeah, I just, so we had a, we had a discussion in the lab. We were, we were having a discussion about that right now. Actually, maybe, I mean, I don't know. We, we, we have been told that the MFCs by themselves constitute a large market. I mean, forgetting about the rest of it. I mean, as forget about the CBD and forget as about as they are standard and, and so now that, that is it. Uh, you know, we should have a standard way connector or something. Yeah, standard dimension connector to fit the NPS or Alicat or any other. Uh, every MFC is now very standard. Right. And uh, most people, uh, I mean, I don't know, is this connectors or is it draft or what is it? Uh, it's Right now, it's, it's it's in. I think it's the the central part of it is in brass, which is much easier to machine. It's not easy to machine brass. So uh, right. So so. No, I mean, but if you have that's why I was asking you this question about these corrosive parts, whether we have to switch to SS. There are, I mean, only three of my MMCs corrosive stuff. The other eighty-five MMCs are all hydrogen and nitrogen. Right. So with, I mean, with we are anyway. You. I will be very doing with us. Test. I will be very happy to test out uh, MFC if it's in, in the stream mm -hmm. and compare it with how an MPS or something is. Right. Uh, but I will never talk to brass anywhere of my system that right. I will not. I'm going to brass. I feel it's probably not a great challenge. It's, it's, it's not, 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 I mean, yeah, so the, the problem, oh wait, the problem, uh, all right, so, so now, as, you know, we have been focusing almost entirely on technology. Right. So we, as you can see, we moved a certain distance in terms of technology. People with much, much lower amount of technology have done much better in terms of of, uh, of economics, right. of, of this finances. And if you really want to make money, technology is not necessarily the best route to follow because it's a huge amount of work. And unless you can monetize the technology, you, uh, you uh, know, it's not just also that right? if there is a, for example, I mean, if the even the nuts and bolts of the technology that's actually uh, made us must have suffered a lot. I mean, for example, if you try, today you want to buy a good quality MMC to give you ten to minus four order, mm -hmm. the you know the lead time is like five or six months. So right. I don't know. So, so I agree. I I, I agree that there, there is definitely a market sitting there, and the. We, see, when we were making this, we were making a gas chromatograph. We weren't even thinking about the the MFC as a separate component that you know you might start selling. All right, the uh, we we got the gas chromatograph working, and then the MFC just sat there until we made the CVD. 
we couldn't take the gas from Amtrak forward because, <laughs> because um, I just didn't know people in chemistry. I knew people in physics, you know, and people, because in many of these things, a lot of the people who would actually buy it have to first either trust you. They, they, even before they spend time looking at what you built, they have to trust you. Right? Because you're putting down a large amount of money, right? And uh, unless they trust you, they won't do that. Uh, in chemistry, I just knew nobody. So we couldn't really do very much with cash money. So we sold a couple of them and then it just sat there and so did the MMC until we made the CBD. And then when we made the CBD, the same MFC that we had used in the gas tomorrow came into this and we started working fine. We didn't have a problem with that. All right. And then we spoke to people in mechanical men and other people like you. And they said that wait, the MFC by themselves can, can, can be a market. <laughs> but you know, now to see that, to see what it is that people are buying, in what form are they buying them, you know, what are the things that can stay requires time. So we're trying to get now and you have to keep exploring the stuff. And so to be the bandwidth that you require for all this work is just absolutely massive. I mean, the only reason why we've been able to do it is that you can train this resistance so you can get into one field after another and we can pick up enough of it. Uh, but you know, if, if we spend a huge amount of time just trying to get the MFCs working, uh, we have to be very sure that, that, that the, market. the market is there at the other end. The GCs, we couldn't, couldn't move. Now maybe we can get back to getting the GCs working, but because I have friends who, who are in, in chemical engineering or chemistry, and uh, they're a little more convinced about what we are doing, so they look at it more carefully. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, yeah. I want to take an interruption here. Right. It's true that uh, as your talk was going on, I was actually talking to someone. I sent a message that we need some very specific cables uh, that should be lowered down in the ice ice cube experiment in the South Pole. Yeah. It's a huge uh, cable manufacturing company. And they say that, you know, exactly the same words that you used, okay? They said that, what is the kind of volume that you're going to lift? Uh, for this to make a commercial, uh, you know, line for you, or right. is it just an academic activity that you are asking? Ultimately, it comes to that fact. While you are an MFC, I also want to say, I know, for example, is a project which uses about two hundred thousand liters of gas every day, and it requires large number of MFCs floated all around. We also buy from the same companies, but uh, the point is that if you I mean, the difference between uh, a lab scale or a model where you have limited number of uh, you know units that you can spare versus making a production line, uh, I think is a, is a big thing. And it is very hard unless you see a big market out there. But what I suggest is, I mean, uh, I, I don't know you much. I'm sorry, uh, I only met a few hours ago. But uh, I generally going by his own inputs and Arnabs and many others. I don't know if you actually this thing because we're not talking about it. No, no, but we are going to kind of close. But I was. Closing yeah, we'll, we'll do that, but I'm going to also. Uh, so, is it possible? See, unfortunately, today we didn't have too much right. audience it's because there are multiple. Awkward time, plus uh, there is there's another conference, there conference going on. on. Right. So, I felt that there is a at least, uh, you know, awareness about the kind of things that you work on, other than some of people who already know. Right. Maybe uh, there can be a better interaction. Right. So, I'll yeah. Come again. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, so, I, I think we, we uh, of course, at the regular time with the regular colloquial. Yes, yes, yes. Stuff, right? So that that's all my point. And, okay. And uh, where, where we also have a large number of graduate students. I mean, yeah. The, it's it's finally the battle is for the mind of the young. Yeah. 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 All right. For the people who are uncommitted. That's right. okay. The ones who are already doing strings. It's very difficult to make them change. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think uh, let us then uh, close uh, the discussion for now and then. <laughs>